Hello and a very warm welcome to this successful garden design show episode. I think we've reached 30 now. And this episode is going to be a little bit different from all of the others uh, because basically of the situation that we all find ourselves in. I'm filming this um, middle of May 2020 and gosh, what a unprecedented few months we've had. Um, every week in my newsletter, I ask people, what would you like me to write about next week? And overwhelmingly, every week, different people are saying, can you write about how to grow vegetables and turn their garden into a food producing garden? Because they're saying, you know, certainly in the States, there's already a breakdown in the food, some of the food chains. And people are saying, with what could be coming, how can we turn our front gardens into a food producing garden? Um, in the States, they have something called a housing association. And a lot of housing associations, it's actually illegal for you to grow vegetables so you can understand it because it looks quite messy so what I want to do in this garden design show is to show you how you can turn any patch of garden be it your front garden or your back garden into a food producing one that looks good um, I may not be an expert on vegetables but I certainly am on making things look pretty and a lot of things a lot of fruit and veg you can actually grow in with your normal garden and have it look quite pretty I mean things like chard has amazing some of the varieties have red stems which are beautiful and you can kind of sneak a few vegetables into areas and people wouldn't necessarily know because they're so ornamental and attractive that you're actually growing vegetables but there's more to this than just growing vegetables for ourselves the more I think about this I think we all need to be doing more of a global food project together because We've had one heck of an earthquake in our existence with what's going on right now. And what we don't know is what's going to happen in the long term. You know, is there a tsunami going to come or is it just going to be a tidal wave? We don't know what's going to happen to the economy. We don't know what's going to happen to the food chain. And as the saying goes, you should dig a well before you're thirsty. With food, absolutely, you've got to plant it before you're hungry. And whilst it might take a year or two for the full effects of this event to kick in, from my experience, um, it takes a year or so to learn how to grow vegetables because you make mistakes when you first start. So even if you don't think that you're ever likely to need it, there's going to be people in your community that will. Maybe friends and families have lost their jobs. And whilst it takes quite a lot of land actually to grow enough fruit and vegetables for a family what it can do if, if you're growing fruit and vegetables in your own garden is it's a top up and that emergency top up of food could be the difference between thriving and not thriving for either your family or someone else's. And okay, this, this paints quite a, a dark picture and I'm always an optimist in life. I always think things are gonna turn out well. But that being said, I always plan for the worst. But you know, even if there is some absolute miracle and everything turns out absolutely fine in a few months time, there's always people in societies that are on such low income that could do with a top up of fresh fruit and vegetables. So what I'm proposing is that you don't just re-landscape your garden and turn it into a food producing garden. You actually start arranging initiatives and there are many already in existence in different parts of the world and in different parts of the country where people are getting together and growing food as a community. For example, you may not have lost your job, you might be busy and you just don't have the time to be growing vegetables. But if you've got land, you could have other people come in and grow vegetables for you and you all share the produce out. Um, you might have come across a guy called Rob Greenfield. He did a very timely experiment last year. He just decided to see if he could grow and forage 100% of his food and medicines and he chose Florida because it's um, quite a warm climate so he knew he could get food growing all year and he, knocked, he went around the neighborhood and he knocked on people's doors and wherever he could see a front yard that was just down to grass he said look if I 
do all the cultivation, I provide all the seeds and I grow the vegetables, I do all the work, can I use your front garden? And in exchange, you can have as much of the produce as you want from that. And he only needed uh, six gardens and he, sure enough, he did survive for the entire year and he said it was the healthiest he's ever been in his life. And what happened, because he set up six gardens and they were just front yards, not particularly big, he and it grew so much food that he did end up giving it to the neighbourhood. So if everybody in your street, no matter how, what size of garden, if everybody starts growing food, that could be enough that makes such a difference. Certainly in a country like England, there simply isn't now because we put so many houses on farmland. If, for example, either food supplies get cut off because people aren't exporting and some countries have stopped exporting food already, um, we don't have enough farmland to feed the amount of people we have in Britain. But if everybody does their part and grows some fruit and vegetables in their own garden, no matter what size, even if you've got a tiny little terrace somewhere, you know, vertical gardening, you can grow things in pots. So there's all sorts that you can do. But if we come together as communities, then it's going to make a big difference because think of the alternatives. We've already seen what we're like when there's shortages with toilet paper. Now that was not humanity's most impressive moment, was it, really? So if we're like that over toilet paper, what on earth would it be like if there were food shortages? So, you know, we're at a real turning point, I think, in humanity right now. That look after number one, that has never really worked for long term. I mean, humanity exists because we all pull together in communities and look after one another. So we have a choice. We can either fight each other or we can look after each other. And like I say, even if you and your community don't need the food you grow, someone somewhere will. But if you and your community do need the food that you grow, maybe you could uh, work out between you what percentage you're prepared to donate to people that are living in flats or places where they just can't grow food for themselves. So I don't want this to be all dark and depressing, like it kind of sounds like it is. It's not. It doesn't have to be. Because even if the world, someone clicks their fingers and it's absolutely fine and back to normal tomorrow, would it really be the end of the world if we had developed communities where we're growing food and it doesn't have the air miles on it? I mean, look at the skies, how blue they are now with the reduction in flights. You know, it wouldn't hurt to get back into touch with how to grow things because even when this crisis is over, who knows what's coming next? And developing that real strong bond and community and looking out for one another has got to be a really vital part of going forward. I mean, governments will no doubt do their best to stop people, you know, being in very bad situations, but can they move quickly enough? Can they make the right decisions quickly enough? When the data is wrong, it can skew things in a way that isn't reality. Whereas if we're all a little bit self-sufficient, even if it's a tiny amount, that can make all of the difference. And what I'm going to do now is some demonstrations and to show you how that you can have an attractive design that's still functional and food producing. Because I think that's going to be the biggest battle, persuading everyone in the neighbourhood, because really fruit and vegetables can look pretty ugly pretty quickly. If you can show that there's some design ideas that will work and enable them to not only have an attractive garden, because let's face it, most people's front gardens and back gardens for that matter aren't utilized as well as they could be. Okay so here's our demo front garden. Got the house here, garage and the drive. And this is the front door here. So paved driveway very simple to the house there. So when you're designing any front garden, the way that it's slightly different to the back garden is you need to think about which is the viewpoint that's most important to you. Is it the view you look out to from the house or is it the view that is seen from the road? Now in this first example, I'm going to assume that it's the view you look out to from the road. Now, the principles that I teach at Successful Garden Design, they're a little bit different from your 
what you're taught in college, I teach something called the Shape First System. And the way that works is you arrange the areas of empty space, like your patio or lawn areas, and then the areas that are left is where you put your planting. So we've already got the driveway here, so that's quite a big area of empty space. So what we need to do, this say is just a lawn, this section here. So we need to come up with a way of shaping this that is pleasing to the eye as well as functional. So in order to do that, we just start doodling. So uh, I'm going to start with a very simple shape. So I'm going to put in, so it's all freehand, doesn't need to be particularly brilliantly drawn. And we'll neaten it up later, but just to start dividing the space to give me an idea of how it could flow. Now normally I say that you need about three quarters empty space to filled areas. So your planting border is a filled area and patios and lawns are your empty space. But as we want to have this to be sort of productive as a food garden, we might sort of adjust those sort of a little bit. So that's the size lawn I would put in, say, if this was just to be sort of planting. Actually, I've just realised we should have an area at the side of the house. There'd be access here. But if that's the paved bit, you'd still want access round from here to get right the way to the front. So we need to allow some form of access there. So as you can see, that doesn't give us a particularly big space to plant. But if that was just sort of... Um, shrubs and it was a normal front garden that's what I'd do this whole area would be filled with plants and then we just have a very simple semicircular lawn but as we want to have this to be a little bit more productive I think we'll just reduce the size of this curve that we've got here for the lawn now this doesn't have to be a lawn, it could be sort of a gravel border and you could have things like chives and lavenders and herbs all growing through it, so that could be very pretty. Um, but a lot of people like their lawn, it is nice to have a big area of green. So the issue that um, our reader wrote in, I think it was Arlene wrote in and said, they've got a housing association, so they have to be very careful. There's lots of rules and regulations with housing associations. Now, some of those rules might be the height of the plants as well as the fact they're not allowed to grow um, vegetables there. So you're going to have to get a little bit inventive if you've got a lot of rules and regulations in your area. And if you think about what they're doing with those rules and regulations, they're trying to have the area not look yucky. They want to create, make sure that everywhere is attractive. So if we take that main rule into consideration and make sure that we do something that is attractive, then we can just sort of work in a few vegetables or ornamentals, I'll call them, um, so that it's got the function as well. So what you could put in here is a backbone of shrubs and trees, not too many because you don't want trees too close to the house, um, that just help shelter or screen what's going on behind here. So, um, you know, you could have things like sort of big group swathes of lavenders and various bits and pieces, maybe a, a tiny fruit tree in here. Um, a lot of fruit trees these days are on rootstocks where they're dwarf so they don't get too big so you could probably sneak a, a tree in there and um, maybe sort of um, a, a bay tree bush but keep it cut as a bush again so that every bit of space is usable. Um, and then the areas behind, and again here maybe we could have sort of some big swathes of lavender so, and some flowers so it all looked quite pretty. Um, and then, of course, something against the neighbour's fence that's pretty as well. And then we've got our access path around to the side of the house. And then this area in here, we could grow a mixture of vegetables. Um, now, a lot of people won't even know what which are vegetables and which are not so things like the celery most people are used to seeing that in a supermarket without the leaves or very few leaves so you could easily grow quite a big patch of celery and just say it's ornamental and if someone asks if that's celery well you could you could suddenly develop amnesia and say I don't know could it be um, if there aren't such tight rules and regulations things like um, maize, uh, sweet corn, can look very, very architectural. You could put in, again, depending on the rules of where you live, but you could put in some trellising or some, maybe um, a willow obelisk, um, and then you can grow runner beans and things up 
up there so you could balance it out and have two because when you go up you can utilize a lot of space so having something like runner beans um, and they're very pretty with the red flowers just make sure that they go with the rest of the planting that you've put in here and again maybe some other shrubs and things in here and then things like um, Swiss chard very attractive leaves and stems you can grow things as ornamental now what you need to do is just take the occasional leaf as and when you need it and plant in nice big groups and that way um, people aren't going to see that you're actually harvesting it as vegetables and then you might get away with some um, really deep purple lettuce around here again if you're not cutting whole crops off and you're just taking the leaves as and when you need them um, and there's some very crinkly leafed varieties that look very pretty and then you can put some more bits and bobs in here so this whole area could be quite productive for um, fruits and vegetables so if I just sort of put some shading as to which bits could be food producing and then of course you've got your back garden as well you can grow things in pots so this whole section here could be food producing. Here you've got things that you could have herbs, um, things like lavenders, rosemary, the curry plant. So that you can still have edibles, but they look like traditional planting. And this area here, it could be a lawn, or you could have it lots of um, different size gravel and some boulders and things like chives through. Um, and then the low growing times there's lots of really pretty ones with variegated leaves that people wouldn't necessarily know that it's time so um, this is only of course if you've got the rules and regulations but as long as it looks pretty you're kind of doing the main thing that the housing association wants not having everywhere look messy and ugly um, so if you're going in the spirit of what they're trying to achieve but you still happen to grow a few things that are edible then you know they'd have to be pretty insane to try and stop people growing food in today's issues so hopefully um, you'd get away with it and still have quite an attractive sort of garden to look at so for those of you that aren't really into visualizing let's just kind of show you what this would look like so you'd have your little fruit tree here lots of nice little plants yeah you see drawing is not one of my strong points but that, that's a good thing because it shows you do not need to be great at drawing my drawings always end up looking like you're floating halfway in the air but anyway um it's reasonably attractive to look at and then if you wanted to um, have this as gravel instead of lawn we could have a few boulders and even if you haven't got such strict rules so that it looks enticing it doesn't hurt to have um, a good backdrop of shrubs and things so that there is some clarity to it because that's the the last thing everyone wants is yes they've got lovely fruit and vegetables but the whole garden just looks an absolute eyesore especially in the in the front garden but it, you know you don't need any great drawing skills or massive imagination all you're doing is creating a very simple geometric shape that gives a sense of space and then the areas that are left are where you put um, your plants so what I want the main thing I want to get across to you is this doesn't have to be difficult or expensive to do it can be very simple you're just arranging the empty space now if you want to do it the other way around whereas you want it to the air the main view is what you're looking out to then it's basically very similar so it's just put in an access path to the back here um, yeah you could do something very literally the opposite of what we've just done do it that way a little path there and then again we could have some more attractive planting could be lavenders or whatever in this area so that, that screens the veggies you could have sort of gravel so yeah that's very scribbly trust me it will look good <laughs> let me show you now some some plans that you could for uh, gardens that I've done and show you how you could which areas that you could turn into vegetables because I'm sure my scribble you're probably thinking what on earth is that 
Okay, so these are plans for back gardens and proper ones that I've actually spent some time on. Now, these weren't specifically designed for vegetables, but what I want to show you is how you can adapt any design. So this section here, for example, that would make a perfect vegetable patch. And you can see we've got some metal uh, arches here. Uh, you can see them in the sketch just here. That would be a perfect place for growing runner beans and peas and things like that and it would still look pretty. And then on this side you could have some fruit trees and you could espalier them so you actually you can see the arches here they mimic what's going on here. You could actually train the trees to the shape of this archway and maybe have some branches come across so you're kind of making them um, a sort of artistic shapes and then you could have various fruits and things all planted around this area and then any of the fences and you know you've got trees here you know you can just put fruit and vegetables in with any of your existing garden if you've got a nice design layout like this that really flows then so much the better that is what helps your garden look good much more than the planting I mean to have a great looking garden 60 to 70 percent of that comes down to the design layout and the shapes that you use uh, the planting really is the icing on the cake now this garden was designed with food producing in mind so if we zoom in a bit you can see we've got hidden to the side here these raised vegetable planters all along there and then some wall pocket planters actually hanging in between so we're really utilizing all that vertical space and you know you have grapevines over the perglas here um, we've got some some trees around this lawn area but there's no reason that they have to be ornamental trees they could easily be fruit or nut trees um, we've got plenty of wall space and areas that could have vegetables incorporated in it should you wish to extend more than just these vegetable beds but even if that's all you've got with that and the wall pockets which basically are large pockets which cover the wall with different pockets that you can fill with things like strawberries and all sorts of good stuff this tiny area here would still produce quite a lot of food and if you need extras then you can just dot everything in with your existing planting so again this garden you could adapt sort of an area behind this tree and around this pergola area for growing a few fruits and vegetables and just have a few dotted in the borders the main thing is to arrange the space and then that enables you to sort of have key areas like you could have lots of herbs growing through this swathe of gravel here and even in a really tiny back garden like this one if we zoom in on the plan there now this was all raised beds there's nothing to stop you having the really pretty plants around the patio area and you know the things like lavenders and rosemaries as I said um, you know they're still edibles and then have some um, vegetables in the rest of the borders there so yeah have that bit down to pretty stuff and the things at the back would be your vegetables and if you've got a garden on different levels like this one um, you can have different areas where you put fruit and veg in so you can see here very simple lawn area and there's plenty of room where you could grow vegetables and ornamentals in with the over the pergola um, i've drawn a wisteria in here but there's no reason that can't be a grapevine or runner beans and you've got all this vertical space so even in small gardens you can make the areas quite productive and mix and match the vegetables in with your ornamental plants so as you can see with this front garden here that's been freshly landscaped it's not a million miles off uh, the design that I've just drawn up and all this area could be filled with lots of lovely planting with mixtures. Now it was all ornamentals in this particular garden but there's certainly room that you could put some fruits and vegetables in with all of this planting. So this is my um, very first front garden to my first home and virtually every single plant in this garden is edible apart from the spiky one here, the formium. But I've got rosemary, variegated sage, there are bay trees growing inside of these obelisks and then around the outside there were runner beans, I've got my onions and uh, lettuce all in there, lavender, chives, thyme and then we've got this uh, grapevine here which ended up taking over most of the house and kept all of the local birds fed 
but it just goes to show really tiny space yet it was surprisingly productive oh yes carrots that was the other thing i had in here so literally any size space you can grow edibles in so a few years ago i designed a culinary courtyard garden for author and vegetable expert nikki jabour in her groundbreaking food gardens book and i'm going to um, include the plan with this video so if you're not watching it on my website go to successfulgardendesign.com forward slash show 30 and you can download the plan of this garden and the entire courtyard is edible and I list all of the varieties and plants that I used in it. And I'm also going to make as many resources available for free as I possibly can in the coming months. And if you've got a garden design course from me already, I'm going to add a module on how to create attractive food gardens. So vegetable gardens do not have to be ugly or limiting. They can be stunning as any garden can. You've just got to do it in the right way. So I hope this has given you lots of ideas on what you can do in your garden and I really encourage you to go out in your neighbourhood and try and get something set up, even if it's only one or two of you in your street to begin with. People need to see something happening and working well before they'll take it on board. So be an early adopter and try and get as many people as you can to start growing, even if it's just a small amount of fresh fruit and vegetables, because that could make all of the difference. And also a call out to anyone that's done any of my garden design courses. You have the skills to be able to offer that to your neighbourhood to do a quick sketch using the Shape First system formula and you can transform gardens very quickly and easily for people. Because that's the hardest part often, the lack of imagination as to what you can do. So you can show people and you can do that for people very easily. Our power is in our numbers and our power is in our togetherness. Now, a lot of social media seems to be set up and television programmes seem to be set up in a way that is very divisive. But, you know, so what if we don't agree with each other's politics or point of view? We've all got to eat. So let's just put our differences to one side and just focus on how we can help each other. The way anything comes into culture and society, and it's already in a lot, I mean, this is not a new idea, there is lots of communities already doing this kind of thing, but it just takes one person. So I hope that person is you, and the difference that you can make to your community is amazing. And even if it is just you, the only person in your street that does this, over time it will encourage others. So I've created a group uh, called Grow Together Food Gardens where you can share information, ideas, links, whatever you want to help you get set up and turn your garden into a food producing one. Now I haven't set it up on Facebook because I know people are leaving Facebook by their droves at the moment and also lots of my customers aren't on Facebook. Anyway, so this is a what really wonderful uh, app called Telegram. The, you, there's no algorithms tell, so deciding what you can and can't see. You just see everything that's listed. There's no adverts. And at the moment, it seems to be a really lovely space where people are getting together and sharing ideas. So um, you don't have to download the app. You can uh, view it on your browser. Um, or you can download the desktop app, which does make it easier. Um, so I will put the link beneath this video and then you can come in and share your ideas. In the next Garden Design Show episode, we're going to look at all the practical steps you need to do to get this into action. How to do your own garden, how to help organise those around you and all the practical steps that you need to take. And I'll provide as many resources as I can to enable you to completely transform your garden. And in the meantime, if you'd like to learn more about garden design, do take a look at our free garden design web classes that we run at successfulgardendesigner.com forward slash free classes.